Hey, good morning. My name is Christine Ann Denny. I am one of the co-directors of Grand Rounds, along with Drs. Kate Elkington and Jeff Miller. I will be joined today by Dr. Jeff Miller on Zoom. We have a few announcements before we begin. Firstly, next week's Grand Rounds presentation will be held in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Dr. Obi Nuju Berry will speak, and the title of her talk is Caring for Families Impacted by Domestic Violence, Integration of Research, Practice, and Policy. This will be an in-person Grand Rounds with an additional Zoom option as well. And following the lecture at 12.20 p.m., a lunch will be served in the Part A sixth floor multi-purpose room for in-person attendees. For our Zoom attendees today, I want to encourage everyone to post questions at any time during the talk using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window, which is separate from the chat. Please do not use the chat. If you are a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question as we will prioritize these questions. We also encourage attendees to ask questions themselves. Jeff can temporarily promote you to panelists on the Zoom webinar for this purpose. Please also write at the end of your question, can ask question myself or prefer to have my question read at the end of your question. And finally, for today, we have a special Grand Rounds presentation. Today, our Grand Rounds will be the Dr. Herbert Spiegel Lectureship. And I'm going to turn it over right now to Dr. Philip Muskin, who will speak about the lectureship. And then Dr. Christina Garza will follow and introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining uh, us today. Uh, I and Dr. Garza comprise the uh, Herbert Spiegel Lectureship Committee. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Herb, who was a personal mentor of mine. And I've written it out because there's an awful lot to say. So Herb learned hypnosis as a resident when he was at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington. Uh, during the war, when he finished the residency, he was drafted. And during World War II, he used hypnosis as a treatment for pain control while serving as a battalion surgeon in uh, the 1st Infantry in North Africa, where he was wounded and, and got the Purple Heart. He discovered with the use of hypnosis that he could reduce the amount of morphine that wounded soldiers uh, required when they were wounded in battle. And he later wrote, I quote, I discovered that it was possible to use persuasion and suggestion to help the men return to previous levels of functioning after sustaining severe combat stress and enabled the, uh, the soldiers who were not physically wounded but emotionally wounded to also return to battle. For years, Herb was a clinical professor of psychiatry at PNS, where he continued his research and study on hypnosis. He taught postgraduate courses in the alumni auditorium across the street, and he trained thousands of physicians on the techniques of hypnosis, including me, when I was a resident. He was a pioneer in the use of hypnosis as a tool to help patients control pain, stop smoking, shed phobias, and ease anxieties. And Herb noted, that until the late 30s, hypnosis had largely been in the domain of what he called quacks. But he gave credit to them for keeping the practice alive. And he said, we are in debt to the quacks for keeping it alive until the medical community started to investigate and find out what a useful tool hypnotism is. In 1969, Herb reported at the AMA annual meeting on his clinical technique for teaching patients to use what he called and we now understand self-hypnosis, that all hypnosis is in fact self-hypnosis. And he noted that about one in five hardcore smokers with the use of hypnosis could stop smoking. He reported on a theory that we again see as commonplace today on the use of a positive approach to self-hypnosis with an emphasis on respecting and protecting the patient's body. As he said, to concentrate on not having an itch on your nose is to increase the likelihood of an itch. Likewise, to concentrate on not smoking is to increase your preoccupation with smoking. But committing yourselves to respect and protect your body distracts attention away from the urge to smoke. Herb and his son wrote a very popular and important APA textbook on trance and treatment, which is still in press. His work in hypnosis has been credited with establishing the practice as legitimate medical therapy, which it is today. 
And the New York News wrote in the mid 60s about Herb that he was one of the people whose work over the past few decades has helped strip away the aura of charlatanism and make hypnosis a respectable medical tool. Uh, Herb became one of the most noted advocates of medical hypnosis in the United States. And he also became a celebrity. And the Times wrote, quote, Broadway actors sought his help to overcome stage fright, singers to quit smoking, politicians to overcome fear of flying. For years, he had a regular table at Elaine's, which is now gone, as well as his own place on the national stage. And Herb's regular table was near Woody Allen's, where it was a fixture of the New York intellectual and creative scene in the 60s and 70s. And I personally had the pleasure of joining Herb once. He invited me many times to go to Elaine's. It was quite a scene. The lectureship, the Herbert Spiegel Lectureship and Scholars Fund, uh, began in 2005. It was funded by gifts from those he had trained and he had helped. And I'll just list a few of the prior awardees, which include Herb Spiegel, who was alive at the time, David Spiegel, Richard Davidson, Roberto Luis Fernandez, who we all know, Mary Lynn Kloitcher, Carol North, Jose Maldonado, and Tor Wager, and lastly, last year, Kevin Oxner from Columbia University. Herb died when uh, he, he was uh, 95 in 2009. And I know from having spoken to his wife, Marsha, that he spent the day in the hospital doing consults on patients, came home, had dinner, and went to sleep. So certainly somebody up there really liked Herb. And thank you all for coming today. Dr. Garza, Thank you, Phil. I'm thrilled and honored to introduce this year's recipient of the Herbert Spiegel Award and Lectureship. Dr. Vinod Menon is the Rachel L. and Walter F. Nichols Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Professor, by courtesy, of Neurology and Education at Stanford University. Professor Menon received his Bachelor's in Science and Physics from the Indian Institute of Technology and his PhD in Computer Science from the University of Texas at Austin. He did a postdoctoral fellowship in neurophysiology at the University of, California, University of California, Berkeley, and joined the faculty at Stanford in the year 2000. Dr. Menon is an investigator, co-investigator, or mentor in over 60 grants and has 268 peer-reviewed publications. He is ranked in the top 0.01% of 7 million scientists worldwide in all fields for research impact. He serves as director of Stanford Cognitive and Systems Neuroscience Laboratory, which is dedicated to the investigation of human brain function and dysfunction using a multidisciplinary approach that emphasizes a tight integration of cognitive, behavioral, neuroscience, and computational methodologies. Dr. Menon's lab is recognized as one of the world's leading, one of the world's leading groups in human cognitive and clinical systems neuroscience. Over the past two decades, Dr. Menon's research has led to major breakthroughs in our understanding of the architecture, function, and development of large-scale distributed human brain networks. Dr. Menon and his team were among the first to discover that the human brain is organized into specialized and interacting networks of brain regions, which has resulted in a paradigm shift in how we investigate human brain function and cognition. Virtually every psychiatric and neurologic disorder has been probed with the scientific framework that Dr. Menon and his team first developed. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Menon. Welcome. Just turn the laser pointer on. Okay, somebody is doing that for me, <laughs> so the agency. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, um, talk about our work uh, on thinking about unifying principles in underlying psychopathologies. And um, I just want to start with this note, uh, set of quotes from Dr. Herbert Spiegel, uh, who is in many ways ahead of his time modern medicine puts such extreme emphasis on high technology and drugs that it often overlooks the oldest and at times the most effective therapeutic instrument that humans possess. Mm 
the mind. And his own work was primarily focused on uh, hypnosis. Um, and as you heard, uh, it has had a, a resurgence and has accomplished a lot. But also there is a broader um, you know, framing in terms of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which is very widely used now to uh, help regulate one's uh, thoughts and emotions uh, and treat a number of uh, psychiatric disorders, perhaps almost all of them. And this is essentially an exercise in cognitive control. How do you recognize something that's uh, relevant and important and adapt uh, your uh, behaviors uh, to, um, to the task demands at time? And so there is a so now in the modern uh, incarnation of some of these things, of course, we know that uh, a lot of these things have, uh, can be traced back to uh, brain systems and brain architectures. And I want to take you through some of the journey and, and the findings related to that. Uh, in a uh, Frankelian sense, uh, we want to uh, acknowledge that this, this spontaneous brain activity underlies an internal chatter and it times this actually looks fairly random. And how do we uh, go about constructing models and frameworks that, that takes this underlying neuronal dynamics that goes on in the minds uh, and brains uh, constantly? Uh, and, uh, and how does that influence how we think about uh, external events, our own internal mental lives, and how do we uh, adapt uh, our behaviors and control systems to uh, regulate uh, uh, our cognitive processes in task appropriate ways. So within this uh, kind of general framing, uh, we've been thinking a lot about what could, over, uh, what could be some of the features that underlie a number of uh, different psychiatric disorders. And at the core of it, it seems to me uh, is, and this is something that um, Herbert Spiegel alluded to, the it's our impairments of cognitive control, which um, can be uh, manifest in many different ways. And what we've learned is that the goal of mapping each of these disorders to a single brain area is abandoned. Uh, and even if it starts out focally, uh, disorders start out focally in, in particular brain areas, by, uh, by the principles of network organization, they tend to spread at least within the network and most prominently highlighted as I guess is the case of Alzheimer's disease, uh, but also applies to many other disorders such as frontotemporal dementia and so on. And so the general notion that has evolved is that we need to really think more broadly about how individual brain areas that are relevant to a particular disorder might be embedded in a complex circuit or network and try to characterize their general properties. And although the, the, the the nature of impairments varies across disorders. A common underlying feature is the inability to adapt or regulate one's own behaviors. And then uh, both in relation to salient external stimuli that are personally relevant, um, but also internal regulation of one's mood and emotion, um, which is another underlying theme in uh, across psychiatric disorders. And so we've argued that dysregulation of the brain's core cognitive control systems lies at the crux of most behavioral impairments. And the general idea is, can we study this in some principal way uh, beyond individual studies and tasks and connectomes and this part of the brain area is active in this task and so forth. And the other principle that we need to attend to is that the cognitive controls are dynamic process. It's not a static network or system that's engaged, but it's, an, it's a process of uh, interactions between multiple systems. And so that makes the complexity even higher and how do we study this in some principal way is the challenge. And then the idea that um, investigations of dynamic network interactions, particularly in terms of um, task processes and how they get modulated, how internal states get modulated by external tasks is I think at the core of trying to think about uh, how the system works but also how it goes uh, awry in um, psychiatric disorders. So one of the things that uh, we've been thinking about is how do we, you know, in terms of the implementing this kind of an approach and framework, we need to understand how the human brain is organized uh, in terms of its large scale uh, systems and circuits. 
We need to know what are the cognitive control systems that are engaged very widely, even in neurotypical individuals, and link them to these underlying uh, functional organization. We need to understand not just you know, intrinsic dynamics and circuits, but how those are uh, modified and uh, regulated during cognitive tasks. And the question then is, are there common underlying systems that uh, play a role across these wide range of tasks uh, from the attentional tasks, inhibitory control tasks, uh, working memory tasks, episodic memory, all of these have been studied in various forms, either behaviorally or through neuroimaging uh, in humans in various psychiatric disorders. For example, the oddball, very prominent uh, set of studies starting uh, particularly in schizophrenia, working memory, uh, as a prime circuit uh, involved in cognitive deficits and schizophrenia. And then you have inhibitory control in tasks uh, in studies of addiction and ADHD. And, and so all of these have been studied in various forms across uh, disorders. And is there some underlying organizing principle is what uh, we'll be working through today. And the idea that uh, we have these dynamical systems that regulate cognitive dysfunction through uh, inflexibility in various psychiatric disorders. And then the broad question for us today is can we unify these uh, lines of research to drive more principal systems neuroscience models of normal and aberrant human cognitive control systems and relate them to psychopathology. So in this sense, psychopathology is an extension of um, the core systems that we will consider. So there are many different ways systems can go awry, and each has a different manifestation with respect to individual disorders, but there are many common underlying themes. So uh, I'll start by discussing some basic ideas. I'll run through this uh, relatively quickly, um, because many of these things may be familiar to you already, uh, but there are some general uh, underlying assumptions that uh, I think we should pay attention to at the outset. So the general notion that a, uh, a brain network is a couple, a set of couple regions, which are more strongly coupled within the network than across. Uh, and it's not that these regions cannot interact with other systems, but more often than not, these areas within the network would be activated or, or coupled during a task. Um, so, and then, so we have to identify these systems and also see how they get dynamically modulated with uh, various task conditions. And so it should not be thought of as a static network that just does a particular function, where there's a context dependence to it that, you know, those of us who, um, you know, studies from a cognitive neuroscience point of view are well aware. And so the idea is that the neuro neurocognitive networks can be defined, they constitute uh, a network in the sense of being consistently co-activated. They subserve a uh, dedicated function or a collection of functions that are distinct from other systems, and they're difficult to destabilize and decouple. So for example, if you have two nodes within a network, it really takes a very uh, clever experimental to, uh, design to say this particular node in the network was differentially activated compared to that. Uh, and so there are many examples of that. So for example, in the frontal parietal network, which involves the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the supramarginal gyrus, any working memory task would engage both these areas. And, um, and you really have to um, get at this very closely to see what are the differential roles of these uh, parietal and frontal areas. So that's the general idea. And then there are other views as well, um, which one of them uh, developed by uh, passing him at all, uh, focuses on the node as a, a cortical node as an area or a subcortical node as an area of primary function or dysfunction. And then the idea is to identify the circuit associated with that area and that could serve as a background for exploring the functions that might be disrupted. For example, the hippocampus or the posterior cingulate cortex in the case of Alzheimer's disease or the insula in the case of frontotemporal dementia and so on, to give a, a perspective from the angle of neurological disorders, uh, where degeneration and focal points are triggers for um, wide-scale uh, network dysfunction. And I, I think at the, you know, the basis of this, we really need to keep in mind that there is a, a deep underlying uh, anatomy uh, and 
Uh, so each area has a particular fingerprint of efference and efference. And it's just a cartoon diagram here showing that each area is really unique principally because um, its connectivity fingerprint is different. And most of the cortical areas tend to have very similar uh, architecture, except for differences in granular and granular structures. And so uh, one of the, so how do we go about taking this internal chatter of spontaneous activity that I showed you to some underlying principles of organization? And there have been a number of different methods used. Uh, and a lot of this work has been driven by studies of intrinsic functional connectivity determined using task-free fMRI. Uh, and um, just basically a reflection of the underlying physiological activity and coupling across regions and neighboring areas um, which are sometimes thought to be a part of the same network can be actually quite decoupled, can define, um, use graph theoretic approaches to define modules, or you can use independent component analyses to define networks. And many of these um, have converged on very similar systems. And so we can then go from this, uh, what looks like a random pattern of activity to systems that we can define and networks that we can define that have a particular organization. So for example, the frontal parietal cortex on the left or the motor system, uh, the default mode network and so on. Uh, and even within a network, if you just look at the spontaneous responses, it's important to keep in mind that it, the, there's an ebb and flow of uh, responses uh, suggesting that with, without the fMRI's resolution, we really need to pay attention to uh, the kinds of processes that might be actually occurring and not uh, necessarily be constrained or limited by fMRI. So uh, the three principles that have, have evolved in the course of our work and the work that others have done, and I want to highlight these because they are the focus of thinking about neurocognitive control networks in the brain. So the first I already alluded to, the human brain is intrinsically organized into coherent functional networks with brain areas that are commonly uh, engaged during cognitive task forming systems that can be identified using intrinsic functional connectivity. They have an underlying structural basis as well, but most effectively studied with intrinsic functional connectivity and task related modulation of those systems. And this is kind of just repeating what I just told you about the functional parcellation. These systems can uh, almost entirely tessellate the whole brain. The second uh, general idea, which is actually a major contribution of human uh, neuroimaging work, because as far as I know, there had been no uh, precedence of this in uh, the animal literature, is that there are a set of areas that are very commonly deactivated, which you've now come to know as the quote unquote default mode network that is tightly and functionally and structurally connected system. And uh, the work in the last 20 years has shown that it's important for self-referential information processing and monitoring of the internal mental landscape. It's not just systems that engage with the world, but to be able to reflect on uh, things that have happened. And, and this is, I think, uh, an important discovery. It goes back to uh, profiles of common deactivation across multiple tasks from Schulman et al. And then we came in and showed that these same areas that are commonly deactivated are actually um, coupled intrinsically. So you can actually study them from multiple perspectives. Uh, and now uh, we know that there's commonality between task-induced deactivation, task-free resting connectivity, diffusion tensor imaging on the cingulum bundle, linking core DMN nodes, uh, and also graph theoretical formulations um, have converged on many of these same ideas. So it's not uni methodologically driven, uh, there are multiple approaches you can bring to uh, study on them. And, and now, of course, we have studies in uh, non-human primates and um, rodents showing convergence. And this is just to emphasize that the complexity and thinking about the work has evolved over the last 20 years, I've, I've summarized in this review that just came out, um, incorporating not just the cortical nodes, but also crucial subcortical nodes of uh, these systems. And um, the idea has, that has evolved from many different studies uh, is in, in the context just as proof that um, these systems are regulated by self and, uh, and also comparisons of self with other related mental processes. So if you look at the search term, uh, 
uh, social and, and look at what areas overlap with the default mode network, you see a very strong overlap, uh, mentalizing uh, self-referential theory of mind and also autobiographical memory has turned out to be a key uh, uh, process, cognitive process engaged by the system. And this is just uh, some results for the meta-analyses looking at the probability that a cognitive term is associated with one of these four, uh, four nodes of the DMN. You can see memory uh, and valence uh, dominating the MPFC, the medial prefrontal cortex, memory retrieval and in the posterior cingulate cortex. And if you look at the joint um, uh, probability of activating, uh, these are all based on task-based studies, not resting. The nodes are, could be identified either way. And you see the coupling between these two nodes is also primarily reflected in autobiographical uh, memory process. So over the years from, you know, hundreds uh, of studies, we can glean the kind of mental and cognitive processes that are engaged. And it's not just framing in terms of, you know, resting state activity, there are their own uh, processes associated with it, with enhanced responses uh, with respect to all of these cognitive manipulations. So uh, again, just reiterating, this is, uh, this is a system that's dynamically interacting during cognition, um, gets um, suppressed across a wide range of tasks, but also is activated in response to uh, a number of mental uh, events, um, you know, monitoring one state, autobiographical memory, and so on. And the third uh, principle that has evolved uh, from this work is um, that uh, within the core uh, frontal parietal systems, there are two key dissociable systems. One I alluded to earlier, uh, the frontal parietal lateral working memory system. There's also a ventral, um, variously called the salience network, ventral attention, singular percular network, which is anchored in the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, which we've argued plays an important role in attentional capture of biologically and cognitively relevant events. And um, and the way we uh, came at this was through intrinsic connectivity analysis, where we found that the areas in these lateral frontal, uh, uh, frontal parietal cortices were commonly activated, but intrinsically they were dissociable into multiple systems. Uh, and in particular, the uh, frontoinsular cortex from the um, um, dorsal um, frontal parietal working memory system as shown in these two colors, the frontal parietal working memory system and this kind of ventral attention salience network system. And so we've been thinking a, a lot about the, these three common systems that are very often engaged across a wide range of tasks. And just to reiterate the default mode network, the salience network and the frontal parietal working memory uh, network. And so what I want to show you next is that um, it's just that that uh, these systems are widely engaged or disengaged during a range of cognitive tasks and and, and then which then led to the proposal of a, a triple network model and uh, ways of studying circuit dynamics in relation to cognitive uh, control. And so if we look at and this the range of these studies has expanded a lot. If you look at um, meta analyses with Terms, such terms like cognitive control, what shows up most commonly are these two systems that I alluded to, the salience network in the, um, uh, anchored in the anterior insula and cingulate, and then the dorsal frontal parietal uh, working memory system. And so these can be, as I said, it can be somewhat difficult to disentangle with um, task-based studies because it really needs a very fine manipulation. If you do a generic task, all of these systems are gonna come up and the notion that you can actually decompose it and then give, informs you uh, further in terms of experimental design and how you can um, try to dissociate responses, which we've done in some of our studies. Um, but um, but it, is, um, um, it also involves complex interactions between the systems in a context dependent way. The main point I want to emphasize is that these uh, uh, so called salience networks, which involves the insula and dorsal anterior cingulate, are. Um, engaged during a very wide range of tasks. In fact, one of the most commonly activated areas, um, as has been shown, uh, is task switching, episodic memory, um, and also affective tasks. And um, 
the, you know, there's been a broad literature on, on the role of, of the anterior insula and the cingulate in, in emotion and emotion regulation, which is kind of forms the primitive for thinking about cognitive control in general. And we've asked whether could a system be, you know, uh, you know, some of the early studies on the anterior insula, for example, were that gained prominence in the field where you, you actually started to pay attention to it was actually focused on stimuli that were disgusting. So those are stimuli to which you would regulate um, both emotional and cognitive processes in order to disengage yourself from them. And, and so the general framing has been that is a system that's um, biologically designed to detect um, salient stimuli, uh, could that also be involved in cognitive and affective control more broadly? And I think the answer has been yes in our hands. And the model that we've then proposed is that uh, one of the fundamental features of this brain network organization is its ability to detect and attend to salient goal relevant events in a flexible manner. Um, and um, and then facilitate access to cognitive resources or shutting off systems like the DMN, which might be engaged in other mental processes. So um, kind of an access theory model. And what we've done across a broad range of studies to look at the interaction of these systems, we identify them using intrinsic connectivity analysis and then place um, ROI nodes in there and look at responses in various tasks one of the things we've done, even with uh, limited resolution of fMRI, is to look at onset latencies. And it's turned out that, well, if this is an area that's involved in triggering and, and switching systems, it should have a very early onset. And this is something that we found in many different studies. And we can then look at causal influences of one region over others using various causal analysis techniques. And it turns out that this uh, insular cortex is very strong causal outflow to other systems. Uh, uh, and that's kind of held through across a broad range of studies. I'll uh, indicate to you the broadest study with the human connectome project data and uh, working memory task context. Um, but the upshot is that the model of this network function has been uh, actually quite crucial in thinking about um, cognitive control uh, dysfunction in, in uh, psychiatric disorders. And some of the principles uh, that we've kind of um, highlighted in our work is that the, um, the salience network, in particular, the insula plays a role in bottom-up saliency detection, switching of other networks um, to facilitate access to attention and working memory when a salient event occurs, access to the motor system through uh, the, and decision, um, response decisions uh, through the anterior cingulate cortex, and interactions between the anterior and posterior insula to modulate physiological reactivity to salient stimuli in a sense uh, that something has happened uh, and to create a sense of awareness through physiological reaction. And so the model is actually quite simple uh, in, and it has extensions both to cognitive function and dysfunction, uh, sensory and limbic inputs, even internal inputs gain access through the salience network it switches on this frontoparietal system and disengages the, the default mode network. So this has been the framing in terms of thinking about uh, various tasks, processes. And you can imagine now that if any one of these processes go awry, um, you could, uh, it could actually be quite detrimental. And those are features that we see in, the, in, the, um, in psychopathology. So for example, if you, are, uh, if you have a drug craving for a, um, say cigarettes, and that is going to engage your salience network and switch on your attentional system in ways that it may not, the same object may not for another individual for which that stimulus doesn't have a personal saliency. Conversely, uh, if you are uh, in a depressed ruminative state and the default mode network is hyper-engaged, an external stimuli that you need to adaptively process may not um, shut the system off to engage with the rest of the world. So, uh, so this is the way we've actually thought about unifying models of um, cognitive control and, um, uh, and pathology, psychopathology. Um, so what we've done in the last um, several years is to push this idea from, so when we identify the systems and networks, we have a general sense of what it does. Can we study this with uh, various uh, uh, tasks? And in particular, 
um, we actually stayed away a little bit from uh, investigations of the default mode network directly because it encodes self-related processes that as an experimentalist all you don't have often access to what you have access to is of the other two systems which are engaged with the rest of the world and can be upregulated as so you can design very exclusive tasks from just a point out ball to a stop signal task and we've looked at dissociations between frontal areas and their various contributions identifying sub circuits uh, looking at aggregating data from multiple labs, open source data, uh, and looking at the dynamical processes associated with these. And I, I just want to uh, highlight uh, a few of these today. So uh, in, in the first of these uh, studies, we um, looked at data from the stop, one version of a stop signal task, a flanker task, um, and a second stop signal task, a slight variation. And if you look at the task activations, you see, uh, so this is all with the goal of studying cognitive control circuits. And you see that the common areas that are activated across all the tasks actually overlap quite a bit with the salience network that I showed you um, and this frontal parietal system. And then we can then look at the uh, causal signaling that um, that occurs during the processing of these tasks. And remember, the goal is to see whether there is evidence that such a system could play a role in, in switching networks, right? And, and that's the general idea of this, the inability to appropriately, in a context-dependent uh, way, switch systems is a core aspect of many psychopathologies and the ability to implement cognitive control. And so we've invented a number of computational techniques to push this envelope, and you can see this causal um, effect of the anterior insula it is kind of very dominant across the task. So if you look at the common systems, you see very large uh, consistent responses from the anterior insula, and that's kind of captured here in terms of the net outflow uh, from the uh, anterior insula. So very consistent finding across a wide range of studies. And the most recent incarnation of this has been to push this through um, the human connectome uh, working memory data set. This is a block design if, uh, with the two back and zero back conditions. We can ask, do we see the same kind of directed causal flow using a state space analysis model? And you can see that the entry insula is an outflow hub and at the receiving end is actually the middle frontal gyrus node of the frontal parietal system, consistent with the view that the salience network is, is pushing in output into the frontal parietal system to engage it, to um, then respond in a, you know, with, with the resource it has because the salience system is now ready to move on and pay attention to the next interesting stimulus in the environment. Uh, whereas the dorsal frontal parietal system has has a shorter uh, time scale, uh, has a long term uh, time scale for processing, can hold information in mind. That's not something that the salience network does. And you can see as a subsample, we wanted to ensure the stability of this. And by the time you get to about 150 individuals out of the 737, it's actually reached a very stable finding um, in this particular result. So, we're very interested in stability and, and replication of our findings. And this result just shows that these. Um, the outflow patterns of these circuits is, um, is behaviorally irrelevant, uh, predicts uh, working memory performance. And the other thing we've done is to ask um, this from the point of view of control of systems. And there are, this the, um, in, in control engineering, there's this view of uh, defining controllability as the amount of energy you need to perturb a system from one state to the other, obviously quite relevant in the context of uh, deep brain stimulation and TMS and so on. So one of the things we discovered is that the controllability of the salience network is highest in, in the sense that it requires the lowest input to our energy to push it to another state. Uh, and that and the DMN actually has the lowest, it's, it's, it's the hardest to push. And so we need many other systems to disentangle it. And you can see that this might actually have a relevance for thinking about depression and rumination in the sense that once engaged, it takes a lot of external input energy to destabilize that. And this is just showing the stability of that result um, in, uh, across sample size. So, uh, so we then asked, um, and I need to switch to the psychopathology part uh, of the various disorders soon, but I just, uh, I know Charlie's here, uh, and 
I wanted to um, kind of um, present these results, which we are we've been working on steadily using open source uh, uh, RAM UPenn RAM data from Michael Kahan's group, and we've uh, now taken these same networks and identified regions. We have very fast uh, a thousand kilohertz sampling from these regions. We can ask questions about network organization and and be a little bit more confident compared to you know fMRI and, and proof of principle here across two cohorts. This is uh, um, task-free activity, you can see that the AI and ACC nodes of the salience network are much more strongly coupled within each other compared to other nodes. Uh, and we replicated this in a second cohort. And then most recently we've been looking at, because it's a memory lab, they did a number of uh, memory experiments, very difficult to acquire. And we've looked at uh, the DMN responses during memory encoding and recall, again in these same networks. Uh, and what we found is that um, in slow wave activity, you see this very um, lot enhanced uh, intra -D, uh, DMN coupling compared to the DMN responses of the other nodes. And it's actually modulated up during encoding and memory encoding and further modulated up during recall. And so during internally driven verbal recall states, the DMN responses are enhanced. And the idea, but the main idea I want to kind of convey here is that uh, there are there's electrophysiological evidence for coupling differential coupling of these uh, nodes and it's not just an fmri epiphenomena and more recently what we've done is to try and replicate this kind of causal pattern of responses we've seen in in the cognitive control task into the uh, using these memory um, data and just very briefly i just want to highlight the main point that there's consistency across you know these modalities and uh, is just to show, so this is the anterior insula, this is the posterior cingulate cortex, two different systems, uh, uh, high gamma band uh, responses in, uh, in relation to these um, cue to encode the stimulus, and you see uh, enhancement and suppression, but it's very different in recall, where across the task there's more or less equivalent or even enhanced during in the DMN during recall, because that's being driven internally. Uh, so, and, and then we have been able to re replicate using a method called phase transfer entropy, the same causal pattern that the, uh, the AI um, has a causal influence on other nodes, which is higher than the influence of the other nodes to the AI. And that's basically saying it's consistent with our fMRI findings. And this is really proof of principle that it's not um, an artifact of, of fMRI. So now with all that in mind, I wanna to move to um, both uh, studies showing trans diagnostic impairments in cognitive control networks, a, a general model for thinking about them, which I've already alluded to, but also thinking about individual disorders and the things that we can actually learn. And there's a number of um, disorders we have studied and, and others have studied, uh, three of these from um, our lab and a couple from others, which I wanna highlight. Um, within this uh, framing of this model. Again, um, there's an, what I've shown you essentially is through intrinsic um, organization, through task-based studies, through intracranial studies, we have evidence that the system is a fast switching system uh, that engages uh, cognitive resources, mainly processed by the frontal parietal system and other systems too. This is just a, a one particular framing and then suppression of the DMN, which you have to disengage uh, to, in order to extend, uh, attend adaptively to external um, task demands. So um, about a decade ago, I kind of took this idea and proposed this uh, general framing, which um, I think in some sense I've already alluded to. So weak or aberrant salience mapping, so the drug addiction cue, for example, uh, prevents, um, causes engagement of these resources that you don't need to attend to, and therefore something that's more interesting in the environment that's more uh, important for you to adaptively process may not be attended to because you're engaged with something that's salient to you that uh, a normal person, you know, some other person may not. And there are a number of uh, other systems which can gain access to the salience network. It's not just external stimuli, there could be internal stimuli, um, internal um, mental events. Um, for example, in the case of um, hallucinations uh, uh, and psychosis, and, and there's a number of studies from Phil Corbett's lab on reward prediction errors, deficient being not just in the 
uh, dopaminergic uh, nucleus common system, but also in the insula, actually, it's the other system that really comes up consistently. And conversely, um, you can have impoverished cognition because you're attending to something that's not task relevant, or you've not um, switched on, switched off or on the uh, internal self uh, monitoring system. So, um, and these are uh, some results from meta-analyses from Goodkin et al showing that if you look across a broad range of psychopathologies, uh, and so they put together here patients with uh, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and uh, a few others, and, and, and they looked at gray matter deficits, and the place where you see gray matter deficits, again, in these core systems that I've been highlighting, the anterior insula actually extending more posterior as well, the anterior cingulate, the ventromedial and um, subgenual cingulate. Uh, and, and the salience networks actually come up to be very prominent in these things. And, and if you look at task-related responses, not intrinsic responses, not gray matter structure, you again see that the loci of transdiagnostic deficits is actually within these same systems that I've been talking about. It's a very prominent. So sometimes gets mistaken, and, and we've, one of the things we've tried to study is disentangle uh, differences between the lateral aspects of this frontal insular cortex and the medial, but that's that's another story. Um, and this is kind of a more recent reincarnation of the thing where they took a look at resting state and vo voxel-based studies of um, uh, a number of participants, about 14,000 patients, and again altered uh, connectivity within the DMN, within the frontal parietal, and within the salience network have been one of the most prominent themes across cross-cutting across disorders. So I think it fits in with this general idea of transdiagnostic deficits and, uh, and perhaps this notion of weak switching or aberrant switching of systems. So it could be a volatile system where it switches when it doesn't have to, or it does not disengage because something in the environment is not particularly appealing or a system like the DMN is hyper-connected and focused on self-relevant mental events. So over the last um, 10 years or so, we've been pushing some of these ideas ourselves, not just this transdiagnostic meta-analysis uh, viewpoint. Uh, now, of course, it's very difficult to acquire data from all these patient groups within a lab and to study them in the consistent way. And so um, I want to focus on some of the things we've done in individual disorders. I mean, they all have different um, um, behavioral manifestations, but for some reason, all roads lead through, through this room. Uh, and we've studied and highlighted the role of the anterior insula in, in autism, uh, underconnected. Uh, we've shown that um, there's hyperactivity very broadly, many of them in DMN and salience network nodes. We've shown that the salience network um, is hyperconnected in children with autism, and you can actually use it to classify individuals, um, distinguish them. And we've argued for reconceptualization based on our findings to look at developmental trajectories and not assume that things that show up in one age range show up in another. There are changes in EI balance that occur across development, including adolescence, and they need, they have, they manifest themselves in terms of whether the circuits tend to be hyper or hypo-connected. Um, and then we've shown that the DMN um, connectivity in a very specific way is related to social deficits. Uh, and I want to highlight a few of these findings, and there have been several. Um, more recently, we've pushed deep learning and AI-based approaches to identifying uh, deficient features in, in brains. The very first study uh, that came out from this line of work showed that these networks can be identified. It's not that there are um, some of these systems are subtly present in individual disorders. They, they manifest, they large, they appear constantly in every individual. Uh, but if you look at the pattern of connectivity, you see that um, in the salience network is hyper-connected and we identified these things actually for the first time. This is very consistent with this notion of hyper-excitability and EI balance and the currents of, um, uh, higher occurrence of uh, epileptiform activity and so on, which has not been completely worked out, but is generally consistent with the idea of uh, EI imbalance, because most of the prevalent work up at that time actually focused on hypo or underconnectivity. 
uh, and, um, and there are reasons why in certain task contexts, actually an intrinsically hyper-connected system may not be um, mod modulated appropriately by tasks. And so then that would show up as a hypo. And so we brought some kind of, I think, clarity to this. This is showing that you can take the salience network um, activity patterns and you can actually predict um, class label between autism and controls, highlighting that this is a highly differentiated system in autism. And then the other thing we did was just, you know, because we're really interested in going back and identifying intrinsic systems and seeing how they get perturbed. And in the context of uh, uh, an oddball task, is actually, sorry, this is, this is actually showing a different uh, signal in relation to the salience network organization and prediction of restricted repetitive behaviors, which is a little bit different from the DMN, which was more predictive of social deficits. So these systems can have differential predictive value and in this case, we've actually done a number of uh, cognitive experiments, which kind of align with this notion that the anterior insular switching system is aberration results in a particular manifestation of circumscribed um, interest and um, insistence in this type of profile of deficits compared to social deficits, which is anchored in another system. So uh, this is what I was actually getting to the other point that we can actually look at um, task uh, based um, responses and connectivity. And we could look at intrinsic connectivity and ask the question, is the system getting modulated appropriately um, by the task? And we show that uh, children with autism who had the most, most severely affected showed the weakest discriminability between connectivity during task and resting. So showing that the circuits are much harder to, it's, it's much more difficult for these kids to modulate their circuits because they are Many of them are hyper-connected. And this is the other study that uh, we, uh, we actually focused on, on social cognitive deficits. Uh, again, does the role for the DMN not just in self-related mental activity, but the self in the context of the other? Not all DMN nodes track this, so it kind of makes it an interesting question. Uh, and the point I want to highlight is that the posterior cingulate cortex and the retrospinal cortex show very uh, um, hyper-connected um, pattern of uh, circuits in, in autism. And this hyper-connectivity is then related, uh, actually predicts social deficits in a um, cross-validation sense. So um, the more recently what we've done is to go back to this point that I highlighted earlier, which is that these networks don't just function um, in an autonomous way, they are constantly interacting and not inter interacting just in the context of a cognitive task, like a cognitive control or a memory task, but also actually intrinsically, they are, uh, they, um, uh, there's a constant uh, waning and waxing of the interaction of these things. And one of the uh, ideas we were really interested in was these dynamic states that evolve over time, that states in which certain patterns of connections exist uh, functional connections and responses, and other states in which other uh, patterns of connection might exist. And, uh, and we've looked at um, how these states evolve, and one of the things you can see, and you might expect, is that um, in, in various psychiatric disorders, we see this higher volatility of states. Uh, so, more, so these are individual participants. You can see each color shading indicates a, a different state. You can see the states are much more volatile and the, um, and the variability of cross-network interactions is higher. The number of states that you can identify is also higher. And this is a pattern that we've seen over and over again. And this is just consistent with the general idea if you just ask a, part, a patient group to do any task or even behavioral responses, they see a lot more variability than in controls. And this state uh, patterns, the evolution of the state patterns is actually consistent with that idea. And so now we can actually uh, look uh, to, to find, see if there are dissociations in autism. There are these two different profiles in relation to repetitive behaviors. One stands at the cognitive spectrum with the circumscribed interest and insistence on sameness, which is uh, different from the motor symptoms, for example, hand flapping. And we've shown that this cognitive control circuit with these three networks that are identified actually predicts um, these uh, cognitive profiles symptom profiles, but not repetitive motor behaviors. And conversely, a motor circuit involves the motor cortex and the SMA and the cerebellum. It predicts uh, motor symptoms. Uh, 
And so there's dissociation in the circuit dynamics, even within this framing. And, and, and the view that has evolved from the cognitive control systems point of view is that we have, um, um, we have um, specific um, links to these cognitive um, profile of deficits. Uh, I think I'll pass on this one um, and then uh, just very briefly where we are going with some of these things is to use uh, newer AI based approaches that not just span three or four areas, but across the brain to see um, if we can identify um, things that we might have missed by focusing on a very narrow view. And so uh, and this, I think, is going to have uh, a lot more clinical relevance. I mean, some of the other things I talked about was maybe more theoretical. This one actually has, uh, has a clinical import. Uh, and we've developed these um, deep learning architectures where you don't uh, push in connectivity patterns. You actually push in the actual, actual time series from the, the task or resting state. And then we classify individuals into groups. We extract fingerprints on a subject by subject basis and see if we can predict clinical symptoms. And the short answer, this I won't go through all the architecture, it's a, it's a different architecture from a convolution architecture and that takes not just features, but actual time series and develops a um, temporal and spatial convolution to predict it. And we've actually um, a lot of hope that this will uh, be quite useful, particularly now pushing this kind of notion of foundation models. And so one of the things we've done here for robustness is out of sample cross validation. We've looked at five different samples and leave one sample out, cross validate, look for classification and symptom prediction. And this is in a low dimensional space showing the separation of the two groups. And each individual, you can now identi identify a fingerprint of deficits. You can then aggregate it across groups. And you see here consistent with the the DMN uh, kind of focus on, uh, you know, connectivity that I showed just in a very, you know, automatic way, it's discovered that these are key loci of deficits across cohorts. This is an abide cohort, this is an internal Stanford cohort, this is a gender cohort, and, and, and these profiles appear in a consistent way. So it allows you to make discoveries beyond the models that are proposed. Now, um, we have two minutes. Um, so, I'm going to skip through this, uh, the next series. The two things I want to say is that some of the things we've seen um, are very similar to what I've shown you in the case of autism. And uh, we've studied ADHD with resting and task modulations. Again, we see higher volatility and prediction of inattention symptoms. And schizophrenia, we've um, used a similar approach and shown links to psychosis. It's probably not much of a point in belaboring all of these. I'm happy to share the slides. And other people have shown um, hyperconnectivity in the DMN in relation to rumination and overall um, cognitive deficits in information processing and in depression. And more recently, um, the model has been applied um, to dissociative disorders, disorders as well. The similar theme that the, uh, dissociative disorders also involve very similar profiles. So. Um, so I'm going to skip this part, I'm afraid, uh, and, um, and and these are all published. And um, so, uh, probably, yeah. So I think, yeah, this, this is rumination. This is depression. So it kind of took a while to kind of build the story. And this is I do want to highlight in the context of of this particular lecture the um, dissociation disorders where Libois and Kaufman at MGH have put this idea out of um, dissociation specifically linked to hyperconnectivity in these systems and the inability to engage and crosstalk with other systems as a key manifestation of um, dissociative disorders, trauma-related dissociation. And I think we'll see more um, uh, hypothesis-driven work um, with respect to these uh, kinds of findings. And, and uh, a couple of things I want to mention. Um, is that we've now pushed this in a translational uh, neuroscience sense, and we're looking for some of the markers and features of these processes in rodent models, working with a collaborator Ian Shi at UNC. And we see very similar profiles of engagement and disengagement of these systems. So um, finally, I wanna put this kind of idea together in the context of uh, psychiatric disorders in, in, this, in this review of, of the DMN that um, uh, 
had an opportunity to do, uh, which is that we've thought about cognitive control processes and systems that engage are responsible for engaging with the external world. But there's also a reflective aspect of our brain systems, which is primarily anchored in the DMN with support from multiple other areas. And this isn't involved in paying attention to one's own uh, mental events, events in the past, planning the future, thinking about oneself in the context, context of others and so on. And the importance of these systems working jointly and, and, and some, sometimes appropriately, sometimes inappropriately cannot be um, um, ignored, I feel. So, um, so I wanna end with this kind of view of uh, the switching systems, which I've been thinking and, uh, about quite a bit as, as a key factor in cognition, cognitive control and psychopathology. Uh, and any a number of these processes could be disrupted in psychopathology. This engagement to, with an external stimuli and suppression of the DMN. And I've argued that the DMN then has a rebound um, where it then reflects on the, um, on the processes that it is engaged with in terms of interactions with the external world. It's probably a global state change and contributes to mind wandering, which can be both good and bad. It's to creative thinking, but also can result in uh, things that we see in ruminative processes where um, you're hyper-focused on an, an, an idea and not able to detach yourself um, to engage with the world. So this is, uh, I think, um, some of the ideas that have, we've been thinking about more recently. I just want to conclude uh, by saying that we've, um, kind of argued for why a brain network approach brings a principled view to thinking about this random chatter. Uh, and it allows you to think, think about cognitive control systems in, in a principled way, the, the engagement across a wide range of tasks. Each task is different, of course, but the engagement and disengagement of these systems is a, is a constant, which actually then leads to um, this as a model for thinking about psychopathology broadly and the general idea is cognitive inflexibility of switching systems in psychiatric disorders and a number of transdiagnostic as well as individual disorder deficits have appeared um, in our work and the work of others. And um, I think this sets the stage for um, further explorations future. <laughs>